You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Since the pandemic began, Canada's healthcare system has been fighting to keep its head above water. Since before that, if you ask some people. But as difficult and terrifying as it's been, facing an ongoing emergency and a deadly threat when we really needed it, the system managed somehow to keep going, to save lives that would have been lost. And as COVID recedes, now perhaps the system can finally catch its breath, clear those backlogs, stop doctors and nurses from burning out, refill the shortages, and reset. I don't mean to shock you here, but that's not happening. COVID-19 has highlighted the growing shortage of family doctors in Ontario. The Ontario College of Family Physicians says it was an issue pre-pandemic and it will likely get worse. Doctors in Alberta are expressing concern about a lack of obstetrical care in Lethbridge. For months, there's been only one permanent OBGYN for the city. In Minden, Ontario, there is no longer an emergency room. It closed June 1st. Hours have been cut in Niagara, where officials say two urgent care centres will close overnight service. The president and CEO says this time the decision is permanent. Yesterday, the Canadian Medical Association issued a statement ahead of a premier's meeting coming up next month, warning that millions of Canadians are still struggling to access health care. The system is just barely keeping its head above water. We don't have enough doctors. And the breath we hoped it could catch hasn't happened. As we move past an emergency that took everything we had, what is broken in the system? How can we fix it? And who needs to do what? Nurses and doctors and the whole healthcare system rose to the challenge. Can politicians rise to theirs? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Alika LaFontaine is the president of the Canadian Medical Association. He is also a rural anesthesiologist. Hello, Dr. LaFontaine. Hi, how's it going? It's going all right. Thanks for finding the time for us today. Yeah, pleasure to join you. I want to start by asking you, you know, from the Canadian Medical Association's point of view, where are we in this pandemic? I ask you this because uh, we've been tracking the state of our healthcare system all through COVID, and it feels right to start with that. Is the pandemic over? Is it still an emergency? Is it manageable? How do you see it? Well, the pandemic's not over. It's moved into a different phase than it was in. So we, we know that the World Health Organization made the decision to end the COVID-19 global public health emergency. And that health systems across the world are trying to figure out, you know, where are we at in what comes next? And so there, there's a few things that that are really important to point out. The, the first is, is that COVID continues to have impacts on health care, not the same impacts that it did when it first happened in that first wave way back in 2020. But one in 10 patients continue to suffer from the after effects of long COVID. You know, we still have acute infections, which do cause impacts on the healthcare system. It does still mm-hmm. impact healthcare workers and patients. And so it, it's not over, but we are trying to figure out how to manage it as part of the broader scope of, of emergencies that we have to address right now. And I, I think that that's really what the new phase means for many years. COVID was all we, we thought about. Right. There are a lot of different problems we have to juggle right now. We're talking today because the CMA released a statement this morning calling on all premiers in Canada to ensure that health system reform is at the top of their agenda at their meetings next month. I want to ask you broadly, we're going to get into specifics because I think that's where Canadians feel it. But broadly, um, what's the current state of our health care system after three years of a pandemic? How uh, How healthy is it? Well, just like COVID's not over, the health emergency is not over. And as someone who manages health emergencies regularly as part of my work as an anesthesiologist, you know, at the beginning of emergencies, everyone's very sensitized. You know, we we see that there's a problem. We call for help. We all start to gather around and, and do our roles and try and fill in what are needed. But over time, you start to get used to kind of the ebb and flow of emergencies. Hmm. There's the real risk in emergencies that never end for people to get used to a new normal. 
even though what's happening is definitely not normal. And I, I think that really is the state of the Canadian healthcare system right now, is we've had these long problems that were magnified in the course of the pandemic that have now reached this strange normalization where people now don't appreciate as much when an emergency closes in a smaller community. They believe that these pressing problems, you know, healthcare professionals leaving the profession, drawing back on clinical care, uh, isn't going to change the way that they imagine their healthcare is going to be. And and the reality is, is that the, the, the crisis is still here. And that's the reason for the letter is to make sure that politicians remain sensitized that we are not through this yet. We, we still have a, a very tall mountain that we have to climb. Since you just mentioned it, maybe we'll start with emergency rooms. I know you may not be familiar with the specifics of every one, but here in Ontario, uh, we saw a bunch of closures last summer, temporary closures. We are now seeing a permanent closure uh, in Minden, Ontario. And I gather that there are other temporary closures uh, perhaps happening this summer. Why are those ERs closing? And maybe if you can give me a perspective from uh, the bird's eye view, what does it do to the rest of the system when an ER in uh, a rural area like Minden uh, just shuts down? I think there's a couple parts that listeners may not be fully aware of in this conversation. The, the first is, is that these emergency rooms, especially in small towns like Minden, they're often the only point of care that's close by. So if these emergency rooms close for small towns, someone's going to have to get in their car and drive an hour, two hours, sometimes as long as five hours to get access to care. Right. You know, I, I work in Grand Prairie, which is a city of 70,000 people. You know, it's obviously a lot bigger in scale than than Minden, but we, we run into the same sorts of problems with health services where if suddenly we lose a certain part of surgical capacity, now people are going to have to travel four hours down to Edmonton or seven hours down to Calgary. Hmm. And that, that has a heavy weight on patients. Not only do they have to figure out how they're going to travel down there, but then they also have to figure out how are they going to survive while waiting for care, you know, accommodations, hmm. food, et cetera. And then you leave your whole social system as well. So it's, it's a very, very heavy weight. We do know from research that the farther you are away from acute and chronic care services, away from where you live, uh, the harder it is for you to have, you know, the same sorts of outcomes as, as other folks where it's closer. You know, the, the other side of that is we don't do a great job in the healthcare system at accommodating for how patients utilize systems. Explain that. You don't need an emergency room in every small town, but you do have to plan and prepare for how those folks are going to access care. Hmm. So if you don't have access, easy access to an emergency room, you then have to pour more resources into, you know, emergency medical services to make sure that people can be transported. You know, you have to pour more resources into virtual care and rural outreach. Right. And I, I'm really concerned about small towns like Minden across the country where that type of planning I don't think is happening in real time. And that's going to have very negative effects on the health outcomes of those communities. What about specific care in those kind of communities? And I ask you this because uh, there is a story about uh, Alberta and uh, a good swath of the province, obviously not the major cities, but has one uh, one person delivering the babies regularly and other doctors have to come in and sort of perform shift work uh, for something that you would imagine for patients is quite anxious and, and needs a level of trust between them and uh, their medical care. I, I think in healthcare, we've really reached a point where, where we allow things to happen that are just unsafe. Hmm. You know, having a surgical service or a medical service uh, like obstetrics, only having a, a single person for the size of that population, it, it, it's objectively not a good way to design the system. And it objectively is very likely to lead to situations where patients will get exposed to harm from, you know, gaps in the system. There literally aren't people there to support them. Yeah, It leads to unsafe conditions where, where people overwork, where they're overtired, where, you know, they, they really can't keep going on. You know, I, I don't think patients often realize just how hard and how long people are being asked to work in order to keep the system that we have kind of stitched and glued together. Hmm. The pandemic was an amplification of 
how long and how hard people worked. And I, I can see across the country, people are, are they're being crushed by the weight of that expectation. And there, there's a time delay between folks starting to feel the impacts and responding to the impacts of, you know, situations that are just untenable for any person in any field. And then the downstream impacts that happen that are delayed on patient care. And in those situations, if they keep going, it's inevitable for patients to eventually suffer. Let's talk about access to primary care. Uh, your statement today says 4.7 to 6 million Canadians don't have a primary care physician. And I guess my main questions about that are first, how did that number get so high? What had to happen uh, for that access to fail? And where are those people? There's always a long tail to the stories that underlie the, the challenges that we have in our health systems. So 4.7 million Canadians not having access to a primary care physician or a primary care team is something that's been building over more than a decade. You know, we, we made decisions in training that decreased the amount of throughput that we had within our medical schools and training institutions. We made shifts in the working environments of family physicians. It became much more difficult for folks to keep sustainable practices going um, where they, they felt like they were still connecting with patients. You know, it, it's very much a, a high volume, low cost churn that the system wants. They, they mm -hmm. want family physicians to see as many patients as possible at the lower dollar cost amount. And, and everyone can probably imagine that in that system, inevitably, you know, quality is going to suffer. But that, that real meaning that people get out of work is going to disappear as well. I, I want to pause there because I want to ask you just to explain a little bit more about how that system works. Would that be the rates that these family doctors would get per patient, making them have to rush through? Like, how is it actually structured? Yeah, so the, there's different ways that physicians in general get paid. There's fee-for-service schedules where you have a certain chunk of money that the government puts aside, and then there's different rules on how to access that. So doctors, every time that they see a patient in a fee-for-service model, they associate the activity that they do with a code inside that fee-for-service model, which then lets them access that money. The, the other ways that people practice are either on the other side of the spectrum where they're salaried, where they have some sort of per rate per hour or per month or, or some other type of salary that's put in place. And then there's, there's mm -hmm. things that are in between those two extremes. And I, I think for family physicians, when it comes to... The, the financial part, you know, there, there's been cuts in the amount that they get paid per patient, changes in the rules on how they can access those types of things. There's been additional burdens that have been placed on them without any additional resources. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, COVID-19 and some of the after effects, you used to have public health, which is an enormous organization in every province and territory, being responsible for following up on you know, surveying whether or not COVID is a problem in the community, collecting that information, providing support to patients who, you know, need additional health care supports. We downloaded all of that to family physicians. Hmm. You know, there, there was a study that came out from Nova Scotia a couple months ago that looked at the amount of hours that people spend on this non-clinical work. And it's in the range of, you know, 16 and a half million hours per year. Wow. That time has to be absorbed somewhere by someone. And uh, what family physicians in particular have been really struggling to keep up with is doing that work at the same time as having the same amount of resources. So that, that spills into your time in the evening. That means that you have to come in early for work, or that means mm -hmm. that you don't see patients during the day. And that, that all has obvious impacts for people trying to access a system where increasingly it's confusing where to go. And increasingly it, it's clear to people that it doesn't have the capacity to meet the needs and demands that people are asking you to do. How do we create more family doctors? We can't just make them out of thin air. How can we create them and, and make them want to go to places where they are needed? You know, I, I think the focus really needs to be on working environments, to tell you the truth. It, it's always been interesting to be a part of these conversations and to see people take elements of supply and demand and ignore other ones. You know, what's the universal rule for people working in places? We go to the places where we feel treated best. We go to the places where we have meaning and 
at the end of our workday, we feel like we contributed and we built something. Right. And so how do we fix it? Well, we, we create better working environments. You know, we, we fix payment schedules. We make it easier for folks to deal with the demands on their time. We, we redistribute what people actually do in their day. So it becomes more meaningful and more impactful. You know, and this may mean adding additional people to teams. This may mean shifting the types of tasks that family doctors do in the, the scheme of team-based care. It may mean creating different rules around how people are registered and regulated across the country through things like pan and licensure. So it's easier to create teams of docs and teams of healthcare professionals who, who work together. But it's it's really coming down to the question, is what you're doing going to improve the working environment of the person that, that you're trying to keep in the job? I want to ask you about solutions, and we'll we'll talk about maybe uh, proposed solutions in a bit. But first, there are some things that provincial governments have been actively doing um, to try to help the system keep going, as you put it. And a lot has been made recently specifically about Ontario's move following uh, Quebec and British Columbia to move some surgeries to private clinics. In your mind, is this a potential solution and, and why or why not? In that discussion, it's really important to be clear on what we're talking about. I, I think in the discussion about public versus private, which the Canadian Medical Association is really going to lean into at the end of the summer through public consultations, is this idea that the presence of pay out of pocket versus public care is the actual issue for us to debate. When in reality, I think it's the proportionality. You know, the reason why Canada has an enormous opportunity to maintain equity and improve equity within Canadian healthcare systems is because the core of our financing comes from government. Hmm. You know, and so as long as that public financing to pay out of pocket ratio remains weighted on the side of public financing, and as long as it's a high enough ratio, which I think we're still trying to figure out, international studies do reflect that. You know, you, you do end up having equity in the system, which I think is a core part of the discussion. Now, the second part is whether or not this is actually going to solve our problem. Right. We've often taken the approach that if we don't have access, then we just create a new location where people can have access. And I think in the context of health human resources right now, the the fact that there's not enough family docs to go around or they're not in the right place downstream, there's not the specialists and other healthcare providers that kind of support this ecosystem within healthcare. The fact that we we don't really track bottlenecks of where people have need of supply and demand. In that context, I, I don't know if this is the actual solution. Hmm. You know, what What we really need in health care systems across the country, including in Ontario, is a real push from the government to consolidate our understanding of where people are at, what they do, and where they have capacity to provide care. Right. Not every provider is working 100% of the time, 100% of the time. But we, we don't have any data that that helps us guide how to how to help those people know where they can help at what time. And it, it definitely is not in real time. I mean, a lot of these measurements are months to years delayed. Why don't we have that? I mean, we have that for restocking products on store shelves. You know, it's, it's a great question. And I, I think one of the reasons why we don't have it is because historically, we had health providers just kind of create workarounds. Hmm. The reason why we really lean into this work longer, work harder paradigm when it comes to family physicians or nurses or specialists or whomever is working in the healthcare system is because in the past it actually worked. That the problem that we have now is that people don't have any more to give. You know, there's been so many cycles of, you know, crisis. People are just tired. They can't deal with the weight that's on their shoulders anymore. And so that, that's the reason why it wasn't created. Now, should it have been created? Absolutely. But I think we're getting a refocusing this year towards the need for data sharing. You know, some some things that have happened this year that some Canadians might not be aware of is that with the funding agreements, there actually is a data framework that provinces and territories had to buy into in order to access that funding. You know, there, there was an announcement at the, the end of May on, on how this health framework is supposed to move forward from, you know, InfoWay, who is responsible for, for helping some of this stuff work in the federal government. Uh, I really encourage Canadians to kind of dive into understanding that because uh, having real-time data on how we utilize people and other resources in the system, I think is something we, we all need to become more literate in if we're going to find our way out the other side of this crisis. 
Because you just mentioned the cycles of crisis we've been in and their impact, uh, I have to say for three years now, you know, we've been talking a lot to doctors uh, about COVID and about its impacts on the system. The one thing that kept coming up even early in the pandemic was burnout and how it was going to impact the system when nurses and doctors who had been pulling extra shifts and in dangerous places for months and months um, finally fell out. Can you give us a sense of how that's manifesting now that things are maybe a little calmer and and what are you seeing as the immediate danger at least recedes? The most um, scary part about cycles of crisis is that the, the same pressure, even lower pressure, feels just as heavy as previous, you know, cycles. So I'll use my own personal example. So in, in March of 2020, that, that's really when COVID became a focus for a lot of healthcare systems. That was the beginnings of, you know, the first wave where people remember lockdowns, et cetera. You know, I, I remember it pretty clearly myself. I was sleeping in my garage yeah. because I was afraid of this unknown airborne pathogen, you know, spreading it to my family. I was uh, at a moment's notice ready to rush off to the hospital because I, I didn't know the kinds of support that my colleagues had within the institution. I was worried about patients. Uh, I was sitting on a variety of different committees and by the fourth or fifth wave, you know, a lot of us started to recognize that the problems that we had pointed out over and over and over again were not actually getting solved. Hmm. We are still responding to a lot of these problems in the exact same way that we did in wave one. And a lot of us started to feel like it wasn't useful for us to be around those tables. It wasn't a good use of our time. It wasn't a good use of time for the patients or colleagues that we we're trying to support. And as a result, some of us started to check out. Like, I, I still remember getting a call kind of in that, that third wave and thinking to myself, do I really want to spend another eight hours trying to explain this to a, another group of people when, when I've explained it, you know, hundreds of times? Sure. And I, I think when you look at cycles of crisis, people get tired of seeing things not change. And whether it's COVID or whether it's our health human resource crisis, which we've actually been in before in the late 90s. Um, People lose faith in institutions because they do not act on the things that they know they need to do. And that's the big challenge of, of moving through this in the next few months and years is will the federal government, province and territories sit down together and actually chart up that path to what comes after? And are they going to support people who are telling them what needs to change, whether that's patients or providers and I, I think that we have to start showing that we're responding to what needs to get done and showing that things are actually getting done in order to restore that trust. Action is the best way to restore loss of faith. Obviously, that's not going to happen overnight, but you've released this letter. You've issued the call. Um, the premier's meeting is next month. We can't solve all the issues. What is there that could happen at that meeting or immediately afterwards that would be a good first move that would uh, be an easy win that would actually have an impact. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, an awesome statement about how we care so much about healthcare and we'll fix it. What's something that they could tell you or show us that there's a plan here? Yeah. So, so just as you mentioned, one thing that is not going to take us to the next place is yet another statement with reassurances without action. But I, I think that action is, is something that is happening across the country but we need to lean in and, and uh, really accelerate and magnify. You know, ever since the agreement that came around the different types of funding within the health transfer that happened in, in you know, February, March, mm -hmm. there, there are folks coming together, gathering resources and starting to figure out ways to deploy it. What we really need right now is, is to take the monies that have been set aside. And we actually have the largest nominal investment by a federal government since 2004, into the healthcare system. You know, and, and in 2004, when this happened, it wasn't as big of amount, but that, that led to big changes in the system. You know, we got the Wait Times Alliance out of this. We started to look at something called clinical pathways for the first time and reorganizing the system around patient flow and patient needs. You know, and, and I, I think the lesson that can be learned from the 2004 investment and everything that came after is that as long as people sit around the table and remain focused on the same problem, 
and they actually listen to people who are going through the system as patients or as families supporting patients or you know, the providers who are working on the front line, change will happen. You know, but, but we need to see the federal, provincial and government sitting around the table, remaining seated, because it's the getting up and walking away that's of greatest concern right now. And I'll say this as having managed hundreds of crises over my 12 years practicing as an anesthesiologist and, you know, all those years of training, you eventually make your way through things. You know, this crisis will eventually end. The challenge is now to make sure that that when we make it through, we're in the best position to not fall into crisis again. You know, if we can stabilize healthcare systems, we can then move to that next step of of rebuilding and, and making sure that we expand and, and support services again. But until we are sure that things are stable, which they are not right now, we, we have to remain focused on on being there for, for people who need it. Dr. LaFontaine, thank you for this. And uh and I guess we'll see. Thanks for having me. Dr. Alika LaFontaine, president of the Canadian Medical Association. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can listen to all of our reporting on the healthcare system through the pandemic. We did an entire week on it last fall. You will be interested to note that while some changes have been made, a lot of the problems Dr. LaFontaine identified still exist, and some of them are worse. You can find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can talk to us anytime by writing us an email, hello at the Big Story And you can always give us a call and leave a voicemail, 416 935 5935. You can find this podcast any place you get them. And as always, I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. Thanks for listening. We'll talk tomorrow.